Hit me with your best shot. Welcome everyone to the Single Malt Strategy Podcast. This is Eric Tortuga Power for episode number 60. <laughs> I'm joined with my co-host, Jean, the Strategy War Gamer. Hi, Sean. Hola. John. Jean. And uh, Matt, the Historical Gamer. How are you doing, Matt? I'm doing great. Matt's always doing great. I don't think Matt ever has a bad day. I mean, come on, man. This is you telling me I never have a bad day when, like, on Twitter, you're Mr. Like, this is the greatest game of all time. <laughs> well, what, what is that Lego thing uh, that you guys said last time? Everything is awesome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm doing great, though. What have you been playing lately? That's, that's what we're saying. <laughs> Probably the same thing that everybody else has been playing, uh, at least in the YouTube world. Uh, and that is Grand Tactician the Civil War. It's the greatest a, game a, a ever. Game they, well, we waited about 30 seconds to get to our main topic. That's good. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the only game I've been playing a lot of right now. So we don't have to jump into our main topic quite yet, but that's that's what I've been playing lately. Have you also been playing still more Cauldrons of War? Uh, a little bit. Um, they actually just introduced, and I haven't tried it yet, but they just added play by email oh. as a feature. Um, so I'm interested in trying to, you know, play against, maybe playing against Finnish or someone else, mm. um, in like a play by email game. Cause I think that could be interesting. The, the Soviet campaign is a little bit lack, lackluster in my opinion in that game. It's just a little bit more of you being a punching bag and the AI isn't great. I basically like did nothing and still just, it was a draw. Um, so I, I, I don't think, I think a lot of. Russian invade or German invasion of Russia uh, games in World War II have have challenges modeling uh, the AI being a good enough German player to really make you feel like you're on the edge of it. Um, it's a much more interesting game played as as the Germans, but I'm curious how that may differ if I'm playing against a human opponent. So I, I'm kind of curious: is it the PBM similar to like Slytherin's PBM, where you know it handles everything, or is it like traditional PBM? I mean, it's made by, like, a single developer, so I would guess it's probably more traditional, like, export a, a save file and then you manually email it. It's not, there's no way he's got, like, servers set up or anything like that. It's a $5 game made by, like, one guy. Uh, yeah, I I, I I try to get used to that regular PBM. I'm um, doing a combat mission, um, Africa Corps. And we, the kind of like the game almost fell apart because I just got tired of like going in my email, opening it up, loading it in to save. And it was just, I can't get it. Like it, it, it's so, what's the word I'm looking for? It's so short the turn. Like literally I click record to do my turn. Um, and it's sometimes I'm just watching for like two minutes. I'm like, okay, so that's, uh, that was quick, you know? So I don't know. I can't get in the, the jive with the regular PBM games. I need like Slytherin's PBM plus where like it does all the work. It's kind of a lazy thing for me to say though. I mean, it's, I don't know. I've been doing a, a it's a Slytherin game, but it's older. I've been doing war in the Pacific against uh, another YouTuber, uh, XTRG for about two years now. And it's just a standard, you know, go into the file, grab the save and throw it in an email or throw it in discord. And it's, it's easy enough. Yeah. I'm just lazy. <laughs> well, John, what, what have you been playing lately? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say the same thing as uh, as um, um, Matt. A uh, bit of uh, well, not a bit, a lot of Grand Tactician. As much free time as I have, I've been just diving into that game. Does that mean I, I've heard from one YouTuber that this is the greatest Civil War game ever made? <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on that? I think that guy was a very smart guy. He's very visionary. I think you know for him to say something. By the way, we're not referring to you. Oh, get out of here. <laughs> No, actually, this is somebody else. <laughs> History Guy Gaming, for those of you who don't know him, he does Civil War stuff. Um, yeah, he's doing Grand Tactician stuff, and I think I saw the tweet. I know Matt and I were commenting about it. That What's his Twitter address? I don't know. I can send it to you after the podcast. You can go like like his post. <laughs> well, that'll, now that makes it sound like we're not trying to plug him, so let me let me look it up. I mean, I was hoping that us mentioning his channel was already... I mean, you know, with Single Mall Strategy, we make people here, obviously. <laughs> Just dropping his name. Uh, his, his Twitter is at the History Guy 25 
He needs he need, he needs some 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 better SEO and uh, and branding there for that twi- Twitter. Yeah, that sounds, that's, but that's good. The, the history guy twenty five. You know that, that I think that rhymes right there. Hey, if he ever wants to switch, let me know. I'll become the history guy. You become the strategy war gamer. I mean, he's already changed his name once because of uh, there's another really large channel that I think he was getting some flack that he had a name that was similar, even though they both like founded their channels at the same time. But um, anyway, it's not the point of this podcast. So um, <laughs> yeah, uh, where were we? What we were saying is that this other fellow uh, content creator, History Guy Gaming, he created or he tweeted that Grand Tactician is the greatest Civil War game ever made, or words to that effect. And I believe those were the words. Okay. Uh, and I just wanted to know what your thoughts on the game are, Jean. Uh, I would have to agree with him. And it's, I know that's a big claim. And, you know, I was, I am making that judgment based upon what the game will be, right? Um, what I'm playing right now, what we're all been playing is the pre- early access game so it's uh, it's technically in beta it's going to be in beta all the way to the end of the year and as i was playing it you know i ran into a number of bugs a lot of bugs and but you know that's typical with beta and early access games uh but i think once all the bugs are get ironed down and that's just a question of time i think they struck a gold mine it's a perfect combo between a stra- strategic uh warfare and tactical warfare and they they combine i think very uh very very well jean where did you get your crystal ball from <laughs> I, I would i've been looking for one for a long time because i have constantly invested in if not money but at least my heart and my attention into early access games uh, only to be disappointed time and time again by uh, what could have been and i'm first of all i'm so excited that you with your crystal ball have the vision that this game will not disappoint us. So so thank you. I was worried about getting jumping on the hype wagon, but now that you've told me <laughs> that this game will solve all the many bugs that it currently has, I'm 100% in. I'm going to mortgage my house to invest in their stock, and we're going all in. So thank you for that. <laughs> but I do have some questions. How do they get there? <laughs> what is? Have you noticed? But how much time have you put into the game so far? Uh, I would say, I don't know, about five, six hours. I just started playing, I think, uh, maybe like four or five days ago. And like half those days, I've been working 12 plus hours a day. So, uh, you know, I haven't gotten a lot of time. Uh, not like you, because the last time I logged in to do my, uh, hour or two, uh, I saw Tortuga power 31 hours. I'm like, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> he didn't actually play 31 hours. He just left it open when he went to bed. <laughs> I'm going to start doing I that, do, man. I do like to inflate my time. No, I, I'm, I'm actually just, how much time you put into it? I'm, I'm actually driving to one point, one question in particular. Have you played the strategic campaign? Uh, yes. Uh, I played 1861 okay. and, uh, 1862. Okay, good. And then what were your what were your thoughts on that so far? So 1861, uh, I played, um, it was kind of like my, it was the first campaign, the first actual thing that I actually started up. I thought it was good, you know, it was kind of introduction to the strategic system, and I couldn't get into the tactical system because I believe a couple of events didn't fire off, like Fort Sumter happened, but it didn't happen. Like, I think Fort Sumter was like uh, April 13th or April 12th, and I went way past that and nothing fired. So when I moved my armies from D.C. to like Richmond, I took Richmond, and there was no Confederate troops there. So what I'm assuming is some kind of if statement or some wall statement didn't actually fire. And, you know, uh, it was kind of like I'm at war, but I'm not at war. Um, so I think like the next day or the day after I loaded up the 1862 campaign uh, where, you know, all the events triggered and every, we're, we're officially at war. And then the AI was much more responsive. So uh, I did notice that, you know, Jackson was heading out to, uh, I forgot what town, was it Wheeling, something like that. Um, so I had to send a fifth core out that way and then um, ran into, uh, not Beauregard, I forgot who it was, but around Murfreesboro. And the AI was actually pretty good. Like during a, when I smashed into him and we went to tactical combat, it was a bit challenging. Um, 
more on the lighter side. I, you know, I, I won the scenario. I just put in two divisions. I outnumbered him anyway, but I, I feel like if he had the same amount of numbers as me, um, I would have said it would have been a 50, 50 type of contest. I feel like, you know, for beta, um, and for something that's pre early access, I feel like the game is at the right place. You know, I, I, you know, historical gamers said it best, you know, um, that Grand Tactician, this was like a major uh, bite out of the apple, right? Like this is a major, major uh, game, right? This is a, a huge thing they undertook. And for them being a small studio, uh, I think you said something to the effect of like, I hope they didn't bite off more than they could chew. And, you know, I was worried about that since you, since you mentioned that, Matt. And the thing that came back to me was time fixes everything. Right. So as long as they continue, does it? I mean, like as long as they're committed, like, so for, for example, like, uh, let's say early access happens, right. And they're going to stay with the game all the way to release. So a lot of the bugs will get ironed out. And I feel like the developers committed. I feel like, you know, they're very passionate. You can see that in the way the game is, the way the map is, um, the level of detail they go to. So I can see their passion and it reverberates in the game. So I feel like once the game is officially released, they're going to continue developing it. And they already published their roadmap, I believe, a couple of days ago on Twitter. So, yeah, I do have faith in them. Do you guys agree? Or um, I'm not saying I don't have faith. I think it's way too early to make any kind of conclusion of where this game will end up. Um, you know, I, I, I want to say my initial impression of playing through uh, the game is mixed. I won't say it's bad. I won't say it's great. I think it's way too early to tell. Um, I think the the argument that we are looking at the greatest civil war ever ever made to me feels substantially premature. Um, there's a lot of good civil war games out there. You know, Ultimate General Civil War is a very good civil war game. Ultimate General Gettysburg, Sid Meier's Gettysburg. Are you kidding me? You're telling me this is better than Sid Meier's Gettysburg? I know that's from 1997, but like in my mind, that's still the greatest civil war game ever made. But I feel like this one, all those games, like Ultimate General Civil War was an incredible game. One of the best games I ever played. And Sid Meier's Gettysburg is also. But those games, you know, only focused on one aspect, the tactical. Uh, and then other games focused on the strategic, like Civil War Two. This game does both. And that's where the genius of this game comes through. You know, like it has a strategic side so you can, you know, fight the war the way you want to, like in Civil War II and move your armies around the map and deal with the diplomacy as well as the manufacturing and all that stuff in the economy. But then when two armies clash, instead of it being, you know, something, a roll of the dice or, you know, uh, based upon mathematical scores, it goes into the tactical mode and it reminded me a lot of Scourge of War and you can fight out that battle right there. You don't have to say, all right, I hope I get a good dice roll. No, it really comes down to your tactics. If you don't know what you're doing and you're like, hey, I'm just going to throw my army piecemeal into uh, Lee's army, you're going to lose. Um, it doesn't come down to math. It comes down to how good you are on the tactical side and it will, that will reflect on the strategic side. I, I hope so. And, and again, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just kind of playing a little bit of devil's advocate here. Um, I think this game has tremendous potential. I am very excited about this game. Um, I, I think my initial impression is the strategic side of the game looks looks pretty deep. I think deeper than I thought it would. The economic model, I'm assu assuming it's not just all pre-scripted and everything sort of unfolds the same every time, which I have no reason to believe it will. Um, to me looks complex and the and, and the type of economic model that I think you need to have to accurately model the pressures on the Confederacy. I don't know how meaningful the economy will be on the Union side, but it's definitely going to be absolutely critical on the Confederate side. Um, and so I see a lot of potential and a lot of things to like there. But But what I will say is, as you said, it's in beta right now. It is not even an early access. And... I, I mean, I haven't played the 1862 campaign, so maybe that's my problem. But to your point, the 1861 campaign is kind of like a shell from an AI perspective. So it's really hard to make any kind of conclusion based off of that. Now, 
I'm not, you know, again, this is this is a beta version of the game. It's not out yet. It's not even in early access yet. Um, so it's it's far too early to make conclusions. I just think it's way too early to say it's the greatest Civil War game of all time or that it will be because there's no way to know. I mean, this is a small development studio. This is a huge effort. I think they have three developers on their team. And then they've got, like, the, the guy behind Lionheart Film Studios doing the video stuff. So, I mean, this is... This is a huge undertaking. This is, you know, I, I was getting complaints from folks on some of my videos about like, you know, this looks like crap compared to Total War. They were, com- first off, unfair if you're comparing it to a game with like 50 or 100 developers or whatever and like million dollar budgets. Um, but I do think, you know, the games that are out there are what it's going to be judged by. Um, and obviously Total War has never done a Civil War game. But I, but I think when you when you have a game that has both strategic elements and tactical elements there are going to be comparisons that are going to be drawn between something like this and something like Total War because it's really the only other thing that's out there. There have been Civil War games that have tried to do this in the past, um, not in a long, long time. So one of those games, I believe, was called like The Civil War by Empire Interactive or something like that in the mid-90s. They did something similar. I think it was a buggy mess and was not good at all. But again, this was a long, long time ago. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful I, I, I think, you know, I was, I was trading DMs with, with the developer uh, on Twitter, and he seems like a great guy. He seems like he's really committed to the project, and, you know, if they see it through, I think there's no reason it, it couldn't be the greatest Civil War game of all time. But I just, I don't think we can say that based on a beta build that isn't, that isn't even for sale yet in early access. I think my biggest concern is that they, they put it up for sale too soon. It's not for sale yet, and I'm not saying they have. My concern is that if if they put it up for sale and folks have expectations that it's a finished and polished game, I think they'll be disappointed. And what I would hate to happen is the sales are underwhelming, the reception is underwhelming, and so it doesn't get the same amount of love and care as it would otherwise, and then it doesn't get polished to the extent that it, that it should. Um, that would be my fear. I think that they're going to get a lot of sales just because, I mean, there's a lot of hype behind this game. Um, so I'm not worried about that. I am. I, sometimes I feel like I don't belong in this podcast because, unfortunately, Matt has said almost everything that I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just um, make some new points and um, talk a little bit about my experience as well. Because for the most part, yeah, I agree. that I think that it's the game has so much potential and I know that that's, that's basically like, especially in the land of disappointing early access titles, one after another not being finished and being eventually, you know, tossed aside and never being, never reaching the satisfying level. Um, when you say it has so much potential, it's like a curse word almost for early access titles. But I that's don't like use what that. a teacher says about someone's children, like when they're, you know, they're in, they're like, <laughs> basically your child is an idiot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, but I, I edit, edit that out. Your <laughs> child is difficult, but he has so much potential. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, what, what I wanted to say is ex- pretty much that's what people say when they encounter an early access title, right? That it like, you know, has a lot of good mechanics, but you know, it's basically not fleshed out. And usually what happens is those are never fleshed out. It has a lot of potential. And what I'm saying is, yeah, I know that that's just the jargon people say, but this game legitimately does have, like, it just sky high, mountain high potential. It it really does. I'm not just I'm not going to say that about a lot of games. I think that this game has more potential than maybe any other game I played in 2020. Maybe any other game I played in 2019. Oh, wow. I don't think it'll get to that high of a. But it's just it just has this beautiful intermediate it's so ambitious it's just so ambitious to have this real-time strategy map that also allows you to use the tactical map i mean it's total war that that kind of duality system but it's real time and it has like a fully flushed out economy i mean you're talking about a system which is like people have been dreaming about this kind of a game for a long time however however saying it's the best game yeah, it's just, it's way too early to tell. And I can just, I don't, I love, I love the design, the vision, 
And I'm really, I'm rooting for this development team. Like I haven't rooted for a development team in a long time. I mean, there's essentially three development teams that I've rooted for in the recent history. And one of them was Vic coming through with Shadow Empire. I was happily impressed by that. I'm also rooting for the Distant Worlds 2 team. And now everything else about me is rooting for the Grand Grand Tactician team. Because if they make this game and they make it well, it will be so satisfying like I was talking with a Wolfpack three four five, another YouTuber, and he was playing some, uh, what was he Ultimate General Civil War, and we were kind of talking about why do you play Civil War games? And it's oh yeah, you know you hear something mentioned about the Civil War or you watch like a Civil War documentary, and it just really inspires you to go play. Right now, my go to game for that is Age Odds Civil War two yeah. or Ultimate General Civil War. I mean, I don't have there's no really good grand strategy or even like strategy level Civil War game. And this this has the possibility of being that plus the tactical level. It's just, I mean, like I said, mountain high potential. But, Sean, have you ever heard of a game called The Seven Years' War, 1756 to 1763? Yes. I know where you're going. Okay. So, (laughs) what if I told you that this is a game released by the same developers some, let's see, five years ago? And I'm on the Steam page for it right now. Because I heard all the things you were saying about how it, you know this could be the best game of all time. and uh, Let me just read a review from 2018, three years after it was released, um, from Daryl Siegfried. This game could have been fantastic, but there are some UI issues along with constant crashing and bugs. Hopefully they fix these issues in their next game on the Civil War, another time period that is intriguing and has done well in recent years. Now... I'm not going to go and read through every comment, but there's several other comments to this effect, and the game scored a 61% on Steam. Um, I haven't played this title. I have no ability to judge it, but I think that if somebody three years after the game has been released is talking about bugs, it's just a warning sign that unless we actually had a magic crystal ball telling us this game will be a success, I have to temper my own hopes and expectations And I'm doing that for my own sake, because right now I'm like full on a believer about where this game could go. But I've been hurt before. I mean, fool me once, right? Hmm. So I I myself am stepping back and saying, okay, what what is the game right now? And my advice for anybody with early access is unless you treat your money as an investment where you like it's with the potential for failure and you won't be bitter about it failing, you should only buy an early access title if you can enjoy it in its current state because a lot of early access tiles are going to disappoint. They're not going to improve or they're barely going to improve and then you'll be left disappointed. And I find this is just my own personal way of dealing with it. I don't buy an early access title unless I either throw the cash away from my mind, I just dismiss it and if the company fails, that's fine. It was a bum investment. Just the same way you sometimes have to treat stock or whatever. Okay, fine. This one didn't work out. Or I don't buy it unless I'm already happy with playing it right now. And I would say that I'm not necessarily happy with Grand Tactician, the Civil War, in its current state. I don't know if I would buy it. I might because the tactical side is already somewhat well fleshed out. So it's kind of interesting, especially um, we haven't talked about like the even the tactical and strategic map have like two layers. There's like the zoomed out 2D version and then the zoomed in 3D version. Um, and I just, I love the look and feel of the 2d version where you see like your NATO counters moving. And I, I don't know the tactical uh, map, especially, I think is already, it's, it's at a playable state. Now I actually watched the historical gamer play the tactical side. So he'd be better off commenting about it. And it sounds like you have also played it, Sean, but, uh, anyways, I, I spoke for a long time, but that's my, my sentiments on this is it's, it has enormous potential, but, and I mean that not just in a, the underhanded compliment type of way. (laughs) I really mean that I'm rooting for it, but it's not there. We have to see, especially I think it'll be interesting to see how the first three months of development goes when it reaches early access, how quick the turnarounds for patches are. And then also maybe we'll see... Three three weeks. Okay, (laughs) but I mean... Not not three months. Even the first three months, I would say that if you give them enough time, because I'm... Oh, oh, sorry, I misunderstood what you said. Yeah, yeah, just give them enough time to like get into a cycle. Let's see, are they... Do they, do they publish, do they continually update their roadmap? 
Are they consistent with patches? Like, what are what are we going to be seeing here? Because, I, I mean, just I've been burned so many times. Everyone has on early access titles. And um, this one has has got me, has its hooks in me because of the potential. Like, no other game I can remember recently. And I, I'm, I'm very afraid for that. <laughs> I have a question for you guys. Do you think Grand Tactician should find a publisher like Slytherin and say, hey, um, we want to um, kind of develop a partnership and have Slytherin kind of help with like the PR uh, so the developers can focus on just the game. And with Slytherin's support, you know, wouldn't that like help alleviate those concerns that you have? I don't know if having a publisher really would help them at all from a developing a well-polished game. Um, It might help them sell more. Uh, It might help them more effectively market and and get their name out there. Although I think they've done a pretty damn good job of that already to this point, probably because this is a pretty unique game. There's not a lot of other games that meld the strategy and tactics of the civil war, certainly nothing recent. So I think they've done a, I mean, I I see a lot of people talking about this. I don't think this is like an, a game where they're spending all their time trying to get their name out there and nobody's heard of it. Like, I don't think, I don't think that's the problem. Now, from a business perspective, I'm not going to tell a developer they should get a publisher or they shouldn't. I don't see their numbers. I don't know that this is, you know, their primary income versus like a side project. There's a lot of things that factor in, right? Like some publishers might give you an advance. So you've got a steady income while you work on the game. I don't know that that's the case that they need that, right? Some developers develop games on the side and they don't want to make it their primary job. So I don't, I don't think that's my place to say. Um, what I will say is I will, it did strike me a little bit as the kind of game that might not, might not have been a bad idea to do a Kickstarter in the sense that like, I think there's a ton of excitement around this game. I think there's a ton of people that are really interested, but they want a really good finished product and if if having a little bit of extra cash, maybe to increase the size of the team a little bit or to, to purchase higher resolution assets or whatever they might need a little bit of extra money for out the gate, you know, if that was something that, that they might be interested in, it seems like a, an ideal candidate for something like Kickstarter. But but again, I, 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 tr- I personally try to avoid getting involved in telling developers how they should run their business. I think that's, I don't have enough of the information. I don't have enough of the motivations. I, I just I think that's a dicey place to go. Um but but that's just my opinion. But I digress. I think what I really wanted to dive into though is some of the stuff that you were talking about, Tortuga, because I have some opinions or, or feelings on some of that. Um I agree with a lot of what you said. I will say I've had good experiences on early access games as well. I think uh the Ultimate General games were in early access and they did a tremendous job of of releasing a great product and it was almost you know, it was almost treated like the ideal way uh, of an early access game. Flip side of that is I think a lot of people would feel like the naval action game developed by Game Labs as well, same folks who did uh, Ultimate General, was maybe not the right way to do early access, or at least there were a lot of early backers who felt like the game evolved into something that they weren't, they didn't think it would be. So I think it definitely goes both ways. Um, I, so let me, let me get this out of the way. So I, I have some reservations, as I've already stated, but I do think there's a tremendous amount of stuff in here to be excited about. And there's some stuff that's already w- really well done to the complaints about the seven years war. I think if you look through the, the UI of this game, it's much more straightforward. It, I think the, the user interface is very, at least to me is very well designed and it's pretty easy to pick up how to play. I, I know you read through all the manuals. I didn't look at any of the manuals to be honest. And within like 30 minutes or so, I was playing the game relatively competently on the strategic map and the tactical battles were pretty damn straightforward. Like, the, to me, the user interface, if, if Seven Years War had, had problems with the user interface, I don't see those problems in this game. I think they, they improve that a lot. I think the, the campaign screen and the information that's provided there and the, the screens that look at your economy, really well done. Artistically, I, I know we've gotten a little bit of a s- dispute on Twitter about this, but like, I, I get Victoria vibes from the artistic style of the game in terms of the strategy map. Uh, and the economics map. Uh, it's not like Victoria at all in terms of gameplay, but in terms of just the the aesthetics, I, I see some resemblance there. And, and that's a good thing. Um, I think if you go into the tactical battles, I think the the zoomed out or sort of mid-zoom version of the map are gorgeous. I'm not sure I've seen anything that looks that good. Um, you know, maybe Gettysburg, the tide turns, but like that's a very similar style 
it basically looks like I'm looking at a West Point Atlas with all the different units on the map. And as you right click and move a unit, it looks like there's hand drawn, you know, line icons or artillery icons where your units are going to move. It, it takes some of the best elements of ultimate general civil war in that sense where like when you when you issue an order you see the line that the unit's going to move across that's an ultimate general civil war in this game it does the same thing it shows you a little arrow to where they're going it shows you the line they're going to form except it does it in a way that looks like it's an atlas out of out of an old history book it is brilliant and i was talking with the developer about it again and you know he was saying that all of these tactical maps are hand drawn by one of their one of their one of their guys and i was just like it shows there there is love and care in those tactical maps and the way that looks is just great. The tactical map, when you zoom into the 3D version, however, and I wonder if this is just because, what are they using, Unity yeah. or something like that? Um, when you zoom into the, 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 the close-in zoom, that map goes away and you get like a 3D image of the battlefield. If I'm being totally honest, it's a little bit underwhelming. Um, the units are a little bit small. The graphics on the terrain are fine, but the unit graphics are, you know, they're 2D sprites. It's a little bit like Scourge of War, which is fine, but it doesn't have the scale of Scourge of War because you're looking at brigade size units instead of regiment size units. Thankfully. So I think it... It's much easier <laughs> to control brigade style units. It is, but I but in terms of like what I'm looking at, in terms of visual appeal, I think that the the train graphics are mediocre and the and the unit graphics are mediocre. And I, I would, you know, if I was just playing the battle that way, I would much rather play Ultimate General Civil War. Um, but I think I could play the map, the battles in the 2d Atlas maps all day long. If you gave me a close in zoom, that's just that Atlas look, I would play it like that all the time. It is, it is a work of art and looks brilliant. Um, but, but yeah, so, I mean, and I think the other pieces right now, the game is laggy. It's, it's, it gets, as you get later into battles, it gets very stuttery and very laggy. Wow. On your 1080? Um, yeah, it's not. I don't think it's a graphics thing. I think it's probably like a CPU thing, or or maybe it's just not optimized, which is fair, right? Like the game isn't even in early access yet, so I'm not saying those aren't things that can be fixed. I would expect they need to be fixed, and I would expect there are things the developer wants to fix. The developers already said the AI is in in a relatively uh, early state, and they need to work on it. So you know, it sounds like they've identified. They know the things they need to work on. They know the things that that they want to work, improve and fix, but with everything I just said and with the inconsistent experience around early access games, not from these guys, but from, from any developer. Um, I just think it's premature to say it's the best civil war game of all time. What I will say is um, I do think that they seem committed to the project. I think that there obviously is a lot of talent behind this. And I also think that, you know, this is a game that has a lot of excitement, probably a lot more excitement than the seven years war did. Um, and so, you know, if the sales are there, I'm sure they'll commit to to making this thing, you know, a great game. Um, you know, if the sales aren't there, they they probably will as well. But I would imagine if you're if you're selling a ton of copies and you're getting a ton of feedback and bug reports and things like that, that makes it a lot easier to to really stay focused and drive home and, and really polish this thing into something truly special. I will also say that it is very encouraging. I've looked through the Steam the Steam page for this. And there have been some people that have expressed some concerns or some of the things we've talked about or some of the things we've seen. And the developer, I don't know if it's the, the main guy or who it is, but the, the, someone flagged in Steam as developer is responding to these and has even frankly said, like, this is the state of the game in development right now. If you're expecting, like, a truly fully polished out game at early access, that's not what early access is and that you might want to hold off and waiting a little bit for your purchase. So, like, if they're out there publicly saying, like, listen, this isn't perfect yet, but we're working to make it, you know, if they're out there saying that to people and, and trying to manage people's expectations, that is an incredibly positive sign to me. The yeah, problem, I, I think, is when you get developers out there who are like, oh, yeah, buy it. It's going to be great. And then they know it's not like that's a problem. But when you have a developer who's like, nope, I know this needs work. I know this needs work. I know this needs work. And guess what, guys? Here's our roadmap. Like when you see that, that to me says that these guys are committed. They know the product isn't where it needs to be for a full launch. Frankly, that's some of the purpose of early access, right? It's to get some funding. It's to get some feedback. It's to get more hands on the game. It's to allow the community to be a part of developing that game into something special. It's not to release a, a award-winning game at launch. And so I think that's an incredibly encouraging sign. Uh, and when I saw that, 
to me that that went from me being a little bit uneasy about the the current state of the game to say oh wait a minute like that is a great sign you know that by itself doesn't doesn't fix anything but that is really encouraging and um you know makes me very hopeful that this will be the greatest civil war game of all time i just don't think we're there yet i've actually have some positive experience already with the feedback from the developer so i i had some issue canceling my policies and i posted about it on the discussion forum and steam just to give them feedback and one of the developers kind of it was like a back and forth and then eventually he he posted that he thinks he's fixed it so yeah i I already have i also have a lot of hope um the developers seem really professional yeah i don't know i just everything about me thinks that this game will be the best civil war game i just i'm not i'm not willing to call i almost don't want to say that because i also don't want the developers to think that yet let let like the developers want to earn it, man. I, if I was a developer, like don't give me that prematurely. Let me earn this. That's what I mean. If they're if they are out there and they want their game to be amazing, let's not do them the disservice of calling their game great when it's still this early access. And I think this is going to be a great game because I, I I don't know. I just have some. It's like an intuition. I I rely on my intuition a lot, surprisingly for a scientific person. But I have some intuition that this game will be great. I just don't. I can't. I have no proof, <laughs> so I'm going to wait before making that judgment call. Yeah, and I, you know, the reason why I think this is going to be the greatest Civil War game ever made is because every Civil War game, no matter how great, has always been, made me wanting more. So, like, a good example is Civil War Two. Incredible, incredible Civil War game, my, my go-to Civil War game, but there's no tactical side. And the order of battle is a little bit, you have to get used to it. It's not as smooth and it's a little, you know, clunky because it's like tiles or cards and stuff like that. This game has everything I want. Besides the tactical and the strategic side, it has things like production, right? It has an entire trade system that I didn't even touch yet. Like I didn't even go into the trade and manufacturing system because it's, it, there well you don't you don't touch that yeah it's it's um indirect it's it's indirect you don't actually control it so the way the economy works in the game basically is the economy is running in the background and the war or different policies that you you issue can impact the economy but you do not manually adjust anything in production or trade or anything like that why does it say auto manage uh trade like there was a like it had a s- selected it said auto manage and i left it Check. I don't have it up right now, but I think it was on the finance screen. There's a, a check for auto manage finances, and this is um, to manage. So your interaction with the economy are two ways. One is your policy screen, which you can auto manage as well. But that's basically where you set like, I want to print more money. I want to focus on you know a grain economy to help our relations with Europe. If you're the if you're the the union, there's there's you know I want to invest more in industry, those kind of things, and that influences the economy. Another thing that influences the economy is on the finance screen. You can set subsidies for certain industries. You can set um, funding for different parts of the economy. And that's what drives your economic output. So, you know, you might subsidize agriculture, which can have a direct impact on your relations with the British, because in this period of time, Europe was having a series of of crop failures that meant that King Cotton became almost, or King Corn, as they called it, became almost as important as King Cotton. And so the fact that the British were dependent on on exports of corn from the United States played a, a not insignificant role in convincing the British to remain out of the war um, as well. So, you know, there, there are those kind of things that you, you do influence the economy, but the, you do not manage production directly. You do not directly manage trade. I will say there are ways to influence trade. This is, this is made by deduction. I don't think these elements are in the game yet, really. But, like, if you're in the Confederacy, this is going to be much more important for you because as the Union starts taking key areas, they're going to take industries, there are on the strategic map. There are industrial facilities in every town, city, or whatnot that produce different goods, uh, that export different goods. And as the union starts taking portions of your country, you might start having parts of your economy seized by the union. That can result in 
you know, you having shortages in, of different goods or the British or the blockade by the union can result in you having shortages on goods you have to import. And that can influence pricing of different goods in your economy that can lead to shortages that reduce the satisfaction of the population. So it's not Victoria-esque. You're not, you're not micromanaging the economy, but the economy is there. It is robust. It's substantial. And you interact with it in the way that a chief of state or a head of state would and that you you direct policy but you don't necessarily go into chicago to say expand your production of uh of meat packing plants or yeah whatever. And, and i love the fact that you can like uh if you go into the i believe the trade system uh it actually has like prices for each like good like for small arms or like for bread and stuff like that and those prices change and i'm assuming if you take over uh, or do the blockade, you know, those Confederate uh, prices for bread or, you know, for exports, uh, you know, goes up and down depending on, you know, tra- you know like their ability to export and import stuff. Yep. So I, I do, I do, lo- I do love that. Like, so it adds a lot, like you were saying, a lot of depth to the economy and the manufacturing system and how that manufacturing system and economy kind of represents itself into the strategic warfare side. Um, the other big thing that I really love, like the thing that I have been wanting is, I mentioned earlier, was the order of battle. Like I feel the order of battle in this system is, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's as close to perfect as I wanted. So I can actually like develop an army, I can assign corps, I can name the corps and name the army as well as the divisions and the brigades underneath it. And I can assign commanders. The only thing I haven't figured out is how to promote commanders yet. I haven't, um, I've been trying to figure that out and I haven't seen it yet, but I'm assuming you can do that. Uh, so, and then on top of that, when you create brigades, you can assign it based upon the state you want it. The, like, it goes so in depth, like you can assign their length of contract then you can assign their uh, trousers or blouse that they're going to have, their uh, rifle. Like, it goes into some incredible detail. Like, this is stuff they didn't have to do, but they went in. It's like, you know, let's do a length of contract. Hey, you know what? Let, let the user choose the trousers and blouse. And then we'll also choose, you know, the uh, weapons and and then move the order of battle around the way they want to. So it's, and, and but like I said, the order of battle is not perfect. It was hard for me to like detach a division and just have it create a new army from that division. Um, so, you know, there's uh, changes that need to be made, but this is the close to perfect that I've seen of an order of battle system. Um, and I am very excited for it. Yeah, I think building your own unit, your own armies, and then figuring out the optimal sort of layout of your armies is is almost like Hearts of Iron 3-esque in the way that like people want to micromanage like division creation or core creation. Um, I think that's that's a pretty cool feature. It seems to be relatively well done. I haven't tried splitting anything off to your point, but it's definitely something that like I just click and drag and I can move a, a brigade from one division to the next or just click a button and create a new core and then drag units over like that part is really seamless and, and straightforward. Um, I also love the fact that they're going to include a ton of different weapon types, you know, for the Confederacy that may matter more because like certain weapons you can only import, you know, well, if you're blockaded, I wonder how that works, right? Like, does it just automatically come through the blockade or do you have to run it through the Mm. blockade to get the weapons? Um, so I think, you know, all of that's really, really interesting and I'm, I'm excited to see how it plays out. Um, but I, you know, again, it's tempering expectations. I think they, they need to do a lot of work on optimizing the engine so that, that battles don't get laggy. I think they need to do a lot of work with the campaign AI and, you know, that's, again, the developer in, in, in Steam even said, like, this is a quote, the campaign AI is one of the points of, of main effort for improvement during the early access period. Um, you know, they also said the supply problems are another thing that occur on the campaign map and balancing the economy and supplies are not yet ready. So, like, they're, they're being pretty honest about, like, the fact that there's elements in the game that they, they know they need to work on. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited about a lot of this and I think this could be, this could be tremendous. Um, you know, I do hope that they, and I don't know if they intend to, but I do hope that they buff up the tactical battles. If you really want to have 3d battles where you zoom in and see a fight, I think they need to be a little bit more grandiose than they currently look. Um, but, but that's a minor quibble. I mean, I think if the strategic side of the game ends up being great, then then you can work through some of those other limitations depending on what the engine limitations might be. Um, but I'm I'm excited to see where this goes and I think this is tremendous so far, but we have a lot uh we have a lot 
uh, that still needs to be, you know, worked on and polished on before, in my mind, we consider this the greatest game of, uh, the greatest Civil War game of all time. I have two quibbles that I wanted to kind of uh, lay out in this podcast. So uh, despite all the great things that I love about this game, there are two things um, that I discovered that I am hoping get changed. So the first thing is I wish there was a way that you can move staff officers around. Like, so for example, um, I want to move like the army general or the corps commander closer to the battle, right? And closer to like the front line. I want to be able to do that. And from what I found out and from what people have posted on my comments uh, from my YouTube channel, uh, they said, you cannot move staff officers. They move autonomously. And I was like, well, I, I understand that, you know, staff officers back in the day, you know, were kind of moving around the battlefield. But like in the military, right, if your army commander says, look, I want you in this part of the battlefield. Don't move. I want you over there uh, over, overseeing the left flank. It seems like a bad officer who's like, I want you to stick yourself by that tree and don't move. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, it, you know, in the military, you do have officers that do that. You know, they'll go up to enlister or whoever and be like, hey, you're going to this is what you're going to do. And your ass is going to be over there. Probably not their core commander, I would hope. There's a little bit of a talk. <laughs> but I, I'm hoping that they can add that in because it, it it would come in handy, especially when you uh, like issue an order to like a division command or a brigade. That order takes time. So when, like for example, I issue an order to the second division, it goes from either the core commander or army commander, and it has to go to the other side of the battlefield, and that takes forever. And which that's le- cool though. Yeah, it is cool. Don't get me wrong. I really love that feature. But I wish there was a way that I can move that staff officer and say, all right, look, I want to pay particular attention to the center of my army. And so this way, when I need to move brigades, uh, I can actually do that in, um, in very quickly instead of me being on the other side of the battlefield and looking through binoculars like, hey, I think, you know, I got to move this guy over there. If I was me, I want to be close to the battlefield like he was he was literally, uh, I think, like not even a couple hundred yards from, you know, Cemetery Ridge. Um, so I want to be kind of like that. I want to be able to move my army general or corps commander uh, to certain places on the battlefield where I can. Wait, you didn't you didn't have that option I when I was playing? Not, I had... not divorced from your corps. So if you issue an order to the corps, the army general will move to where you tell him to move. But the corps, like you can't necessarily click him and move him up front right by a particular brigade under his sub command. That'll cause the core to move yeah, as a whole. Yeah, which I hate. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That's how I do it, actually. I give orders to the core first, and then I give individual orders to the divisions. And and you can actually give individual orders to the brigades as well, but you can't tell a general itself to move to a specific spot. I see. So So what you're saying is the way I do it is okay, uh, I I mean, in my I played like one tactical battle, so I, I have not a lot of experience. But I thought that you could move like the core, which moves where the core commander will be. Then you could move the uh, divisions after that, which means that that'll override the core's general orders. Does that work? You you can yes. So that that is true. I think what John is saying is he's saying I want to grab my core commander and ride him right up by the second brigade. I get it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Or by the first brigade, because you are the first brigade. I agree. I, I think that's a good recommendation, John. Yeah, I mean, I kind of like. I, I like one of the things I like is when I issue an order like that. Though the the commanders kind of do their thing, and there's this element of like certain commanders might have feuds with other commanders, and so they might not entirely listen to you. And I think that's going to drive some war gamers a little bit a little bit mad because I, I think a lot of war gamers want to be a little bit mi- micromanaging. Don't worry, it's but an I, option you can turn on and off. Oh, well, you're right. Um, but I think one of the cool things about that is this idea of this living command arrangement that you have to manage, like personalities and relationships, which if you read any Civil War book worth its salt, you will get the sense that these guys were feuding high schoolers <laughs> that were fighting this gigantic war amongst cliques of like, oh, they're the jocks or the McClellanites. And, you know, literally just it influenced and, and had a serious impact on some of the battles you know, especially up through the early to mid period of the war. So I think, um, you know, Hooker loses command of the army to some extent because he loses loses complete trust of, of any of his subordinates mm. and they just become so disgusted with him. Um, so I, I think, you know, it's 
it's an interesting feature. It would be, you know, I, I think I, it took me a little while to get used to that as well, Jean, where I was like, well, wait, why isn't the general moving exactly where I told him to? And then I realized, oh, he's tied to the core and the core is moving there. Okay. You know, it's a little bit different. It's different than any war game I've seen before. Um, probably the closest analog to how it treats some of that is when you've got like all the AI turned on in like Scourge of War and like you'll see AI commanders riding all over Kingdom Come, like issuing their own orders, doing their own thing. Um but yeah, it could take some getting used to. But you can turn it. You can at least turn off some of some of the AI there. Hmm. Well, I'm assuming this is going to be uh, the first of many podcasts where we talk about Grand Tactician because <laughs> I I think we t- it just barely scratches the surface. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. Um... But there was one other big big news item that I wanted to touch. You know, I know we've been talking about Grand Tactician for for about almost an hour. Um, I think we'll probably be talking about it more as it moves through development and, and gets closer to uh, to release, not just early access, but as they release updates and whatnot that enhance the game. But uh, there was one other really big piece of wargaming news in the last week that uh, that came out that I think a lot of people never thought they would see, and that is uh, the folks over at Battle, uh, Battlefront um, have announced that they're coming to Steam, which... That by itself was a shocker. They, for many years, have said that is not something they're considering. Uh, and even at times, people took that to mean ever. Um, but it, it looks like the folks over at Battlefront are coming to Steam, and they're partnering with someone. So they're, they're you know, historically, they've always been... Or I think they've actually worked with a couple other developers. I thought I saw a post saying they worked with Paradox at one point. But um, apparently, they're partnering with Slytherin uh, to publish... Uh, uh, c- combat mission shock force two on steam on august 25th so that's pretty freaking big news yeah i mean i was kind of shocked by that because battlefront was always kind of like doing their own thing and then all of a sudden like they're partnering with slytherin which i think is an incredible um it's an incredible incredible partnership i think it's historic because finally it brings you know i'm not i'm not trying to say anything about battlefront but i feel like it brings them out of the shadows because you know i i always go to battlefront.com but they're rarely ever in like gaming news like if you go to wargamer.com or anything like that you know i rarely see them on those kind of things and they're not on steam so i never see them uh, their games suggested so once in a blue i'll go to battlefront.com it's like oh they came out with this new game let me download it um but now that they're on steam and partnered with uh slytherine i'm hoping to see their name more often well and they did say in some of their forums anyway that they're uh this is the first but they expect more games to come to steam which i think is you know obviously they're they're gonna test this out and see how it goes and if it goes well then you know I would expect to see the catalog migrated over. At least initially, it's just going to be Shock Force Two. Um, I used to play a lot of Battlefront I, er, games. Uh, I even played the original Strategic Command. They used, by the way, they used to be the developer behind the original Strategic Command hmm. games, uh, and then they sold the rights to Slytherin. So I thought that was interesting, or to Fury Software, who then went with Slytherin. Um, but yeah, I played the original three. Uh, Africa Core, uh, Combat Mission, Barbarossa to Berlin, and then uh, Beyond Overlord. I went in reverse order. Um, but uh, I haven't played a lot of their newer stuff. I did play the original Shock Force, which I think Shock Force 2 is just a modernized version of that. Um, but I know they've had a bunch of other games out. Uh, I'm really excited because I know on uh, Developer Dialogue, we're going to be getting a chance to uh, to hopefully talk to them. Um, and I'm really curious to hear about, you know, hear, hear about them, uh, and, and, you know, talk to one of the developers over there. But, uh, I think this is big news. I think, I hope this has the, you know, this definitely has the potential to be huge for them. So I, you know, and I'm excited to hear they're already talking about potentially bringing more of their catalog. I'm really curious by the way. So I was reading a post by the administrator of Battlefront and their forums, which almost made it sound to me like they're really interested in the professional side of gaming. Um, like he, they were talking about like professional war gaming with, I'm assuming like, you know, you know, like command pro where they work with different governments to do war game simulations. I wonder how much matrix and Slytherins like success with command modern operations pro might have influenced this partnership. Um, because it, I think it was, I, I, you know, they, they said it. Um, and, and I thought, if they're bringing up this professional side of things, uh, that's that's interesting to say the least. Um, so, 
You know, they said commercial possibilities. They're talking about the relationship with them in the past. They said, we're pretty excited about the expanded relationship with Slytherin. We've been talking with them for this for about four years, something like that. Commercial possibilities were kicked around in parallel with our military contract agreement discussions. But we wanted to work with them for a bit on the military side before committing to commercial stuff. So, like, I wonder how much of this, like, expanded relationship of Slytherin into the professional side of things might bring other commercial opportunities. Who knows? Maybe like Steel Beast Pro or like other commercial simulators might might see uh, a, a benefit in in working with Slytherin to to bring some of these types of simulations to to commercial audiences. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, this is um, I I mean, this is this is big news. So, I mean, um, I'm I'm hoping that it works very well. I mean, I hope it. You know, uh, I hope this explodes and you know more games come to the uh, to the library. One thing that I really didn't like is when I purchased like Combat Mission uh, games, I would always lose the executable file, right? And I know you can re-download from the websites, but you I think you only get a certain limited amount of times that you can re-download it. But I love having all my games in like my Steam catalog, you know, and whenever I you know launch a new, you know, virtual machine or, you know, a new OS or something like that. I'll go in and I'll select a whole bunch of games on my Steam catalog. And it's not until I go into, you know, this, you know, a file on my computer and say, oh, that's right, I have Combat Mission, this game. And I don't play it as often because I don't see it as often. When it's in my Steam library, I usually go up and down my Steam library. It's like, oh, I'm in the mood for this. I would love for Combat Mission to be in part of my steam library and now that it is it's going to be awesome because uh, i'll be playing it more because i see it more yeah i think it'll just be easier to keep track like i i like i said i played the original combat mission games and i kind of lost track with them um you know unless to your point unless you go to their website and you you follow them more more actively it's it's hard to stay up to date and so I think if they're there on Steam and if they're working with Slytherin, like another major war game publisher, I think it'll be a lot easier for them to make sure that people don't just fall away, you know, out of sheer inertia or just, you know, just losing track of a developer. You know, uh, you know, if you're a big fan, you'll probably go to the forums and whatnot, but I'm sure a lot of people don't. So this this has a potential to be really, really big for them. And there have been a lot of developers in the last two, three years or so, maybe it's been a little bit longer than that, that have long avoided Steam, that have, have come around to publishing on Steam. Uh, the out-of-the-park development folks, the guys who make out-of-the-park baseball, for like 15 years they didn't go to Steam. Then eventually they went to Steam, and now I think they're probably doing better than they ever have before. They went from being like this you know, incredibly detailed baseball management game with no official license or tie to Major League Baseball. Now they have, they're like one of the few games that has an actual MLB license. So obviously they're, they seem to be doing well in there. Major League Baseball, some organizations like minor league teams actually use the product to like actually simulate things almost like a command pro type scenario. You know, obviously Slytherin for a really long time, people were begging them to come to steam. Eventually they did. And, you know, obviously they've stuck around on steam. So it seems like they've, they've seen success there as well. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of developers that I think are in that spot. Didn't IL2 just recently come to steam? Um, after years of being kind of off on their own, IL2, the battle, great battles of Stalingrad or whatnot. Um, for a long time, they weren't on steam. I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, Tortuga. Um, I don't know actually when they, uh, when they went to steam, they originally, I mean, you still see a pretty heavy, they're a bit of a parallel to battlefront in that sense that they, they don't like the steam stuff. They still try to get you if you can, and no sense not to, by the way, they still try to get you to buy their packages from the website itself, uh, not from steam because obviously steam takes a cut. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's the biggest news about this, uh, that Slytherine is going to go ahead and take the Battlefront to Steam, where we've all, I mean, it's it's an underplayed game, I think, that Battlefront has been kind of the same way the Rule of the Waves was, uh, has been okay for their own reasons, keeping their game, I don't want to say cloistered, but <laughs> um, not as widespread as it probably could be, because they had full control over everything. So having Slytherin take over and pushing the product onto Steam, I hope that they have a good payoff for this because I think that this is a game which has been under underplayed. I mean, I've always seen it, but I never wanted to get into the whole mess of crossing over to the form and all that. And 
for some reason I have never gotten into combat missions and I think it, part of my hesitance has always, has been just I've heard things about needing to deal with the form there and everything which is probably not true it's just this ugly rumor or this ugly um, yeah it's like an ugly rumor about Battlefront that they're <laughs> that they're this cloistered form community and it's hard to you know interface with them easily well hopefully it's successful i mean there's definitely other games that are super groggy that are on steam and i i my experience with combat mission was always that it was easier to approach than something like Graviteam. but Graviteam is very very detailed and a similar type of a game and that's on steam and they seem to be doing well so um you know i think uh i think that was uh you know that's the big news and i know i'm really excited and I'm I'm looking forward to hopefully being able to to talk talk to them on uh, the upcoming developer dialogue uh, podcast episode and uh, you know hearing 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 about their games and their plans and um, maybe a little bit about this we'll see how much they can talk about or how much they're willing to talk about but um, I'm really excited to talk to them because Combat Mission uh, Beyond Overlord which was the first Combat Mission game I think was pretty transformative in the war gaming space. And I played the hell out of it, and I remember when it came out, and I remember downloading the demo, and I remember like that was one of the early war games that I played a ton of. But I fell away from the series over time, and I think part of it is just because they weren't center of mind, they weren't they weren't present. Uh, and so I'm excited to see see what comes of this partnership. Yeah, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be interesting. We'll uh, we have them uh, like um, Matt was saying. We're going to have them on the Developer Dialogue podcast. I believe it's going to be on August twenty third. So if you go to developerdialogue dot com, you can uh, submit your question. Uh, if you have a question for the developer, you know we'll ask them. So um, wait, is that going to be live as we're recording? I am going to try to set something like that up. Um, this is our first time doing it, so uh, we'll see how it goes. I, this is my first time I'm doing it uh, with a live. Well, make sure you put a link in the description of the podcast if that's the case where people can actually go yeah, and listen. We'll do. To it. Definitely. Uh, I think Tortuga already headed out. Um, Traitor. He just ran away on us. What a coward. <laughs> yeah, I'm thankful. Uh... Didn't want to admit he was drinking a wine cooler. <laughs> yeah, what are you drinking? I mean, I've been drinking a beer that's made very close to where I live. It's uh, called uh, Bleacher Bum. Oh. And it is a, uh, it's kind of, it has a little bit of a, a, a fruit type flavor, but I think, I, I don't even remember what type of beer it is. But it's made by a brewing company called Spiteful, uh, which is a small Chicago-based brewery. Um, so if you're in the Chicago area, you can grab it at like grocery stores and stuff. They also have a tap room. Uh, I don't think it's really anywhere outside the city. I could be wrong, but I think it's pretty small. I think they only have like 4,000 barrels a year. Um, but it's it's really good. That's actually... I really love how all these breweries have these like <laughs> unique names. I believe it's supposed to be like bleacher bums from like Wrigley Field and like the Chicago Cubs, of which I'm not a fan at all. But, um, you know, I think that's probably where it, where it comes from. It's like, it looks like a guy's like heckling you on the can. It's like a guy with a giant beer belly, like in like summer outfit, you know, with his hand up against his mouth, like he's yelling, <laughs> but it's actually a really, a really good, really drinkable beer. And it's not light or anything like that. It's like five or 6% alcohol by volume. So it's a reasonable amount of alcohol in it. And it's, it's tasty and it's, you know, it's not a hoppy beer. It's definitely more of like a summer beer. Um, but it's not, it's not like a Rodler or anything. I don't actually have a can by me and I finished, finished my beer halfway through the podcast. So I'm not sure. I can't like read you like, oh, it's like a Pilsner with hints of whatever. I just know it's good and I like it. Well, I'm having my uh, typical coffee, so uh, yeah, um, you know. Next time on the Single Bean Podcast, we talk about Colombian roasts. I really should try different co coffees, you know. I, uh, I I just stick with my tried and true. It's kind of like the beer that I always drink, you know. It's always the same, same beer. I guess... Uh... Hey man, strong black coffee is the way to go. <laughs> You gotta get like that navy brew. <laughs> yeah, my uh, my mother in law tried to offer me Maxwell House, and I was like, I was about to gag. I was like, no, nope, that's not happening. <laughs> I was like, you only have one life to live. I'll probably cut it short. Hey, you know, whatever whatever floats your boat. All right, I, I've had I've had Maxwell House at work, and it got Ooh. the job done. I've had Lavazza, and you know, it's good too. And I think right now I have uh, some whole beans of intelligentsia in the in the 
kitchen as well. Just, you know, when I'm ready, I grind it up and throw it in the French press. And Oh, you got a French you know, press. Throw it in the fridge overnight and you can make it a, make it a cold brew or you, you brew it hot and just drink it right away. You know, whichever you, whichever you want to do, man, you can, you know, man, you can do whatever you want to do. It's just some great coffee and it's just makes the day great folders in your cup <laughs> someone stop me by the way i'm just going and going and going <laughs> oh man yeah i um folders in your cup yeah that you're never gonna catch me uh getting that even if i'm like like about to fall asleep and i'm in the middle of something i need to do there's no way i'm gonna have that crap it's kind of like going back to like budweiser or like i don't know coors light and no offense i know you guys some people are gonna like rag on me and be like dude coors like this and you know budweiser that and wasn't it a couple episodes ago that tortuga was talking about drinking uh high life oh that's right yeah yeah champagne of beers we were we were we were ordering uh, takeout from a place, um, or like you know curbside pickup, whatever. And uh, the menu had like had beer options because I guess you can do that to go as well. And the first one on the top of the menu was uh, was Miller High Life, and I snapped a picture of it and posted it in Tortuga's Discord. <laughs> I think he must have missed the joke. He didn't he didn't uh, didn't respond to it, but I I was this close to getting it just for Tortuga. Yeah, I uh, yeah I can never do that. It's like it's like you know you you got to step up in life so like you know you start out with a studio apartment you move to one bedroom you get a nice town home you get something bigger then you eventually get to a mansion if you're that uh, lucky and successful you never go from the mansion down to a studio apartment i mean but you might have a studio apartment and a mansion who you know the studios downtown in like downtown new york city or whatever you got to get away to the city and and the mansions out in New Jersey or whatnot where you live most People of with the studio time. apartments in downtown New York City use it, I think, for uh, other mischievous means, uh, especially with the secretary. Wow, dude. <laughs> you're, you're watching too much too much Netflix in this quarantine yeah, world. Yeah, that's definitely true. I think that was the premise of a movie once. It was like... a group of like people like got this like apartment for their own nefarious purposes and then someone got murdered pretty sure i saw a trailer that was to that effect uh, i think it was a law and order episode about that i mean i'm sure there have been like half a dozen movies anyway we've been going on too long talking about shit and uh it's less fun when tortuga's not here to defend himself so <laughs> all right so i guess uh matt do you want to take us out bye <laughs>